science is a wonderful piece of civil engineering infrastructure and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it was constructed and how it was modified through time uh, to keep it a very vibrant and viable place today. Hopefully this might convince some people to become civil engineers. It certainly is a very exciting profession. Here we are on top of the giant Goliath crane. The crane spans 120 metres over number one dock and was brought here to help in the assembly of the new aircraft carriers. And from up here you get a wonderful view of the Fourth Estuary. If we go a couple of miles downstream, you'll see the iconic Fourth Bridges. And a few more miles upstream, Kincardine Bridge. And it's absolutely no coincidence that famous names associated with the construction of these bridges, Sir William Arnold and Sir Alexander Gibb, also had a major part to play in the construction of Rosyth. Sir Alexander Gibb, in fact, was Chief Civil Engineer Advisor to the Admiralty. He project managed the construction of Forsyth and he was a former President of the Institution of Civil Engineers, as was Sir William Arrow. So when did it all begin? In 1903, the Admiralty decided that it wanted to strengthen its strategic capability on the eastern seaboard of the United Kingdom and decided to build a dockyard at Forsyth. In 1909, the contract documentation was drawn up and the winning contractor, Easton Gibb, was awarded the contract. The idea was to dry and build as much of the dockyard as possible in the dry. So the starting point was to push out clay dams from the shore and to form big lagoons in the foreshore. The lagoons were then pumped dry to expose the seabed and as much of the construction work took place in the dry on the seabed. By 1911, the north wall of the main basin, that's it across there, was substantially complete and the entrances to the three graving docks were starting to be formed. You can imagine the amount of material and men that had to be moved around in a construction enterprise of that size. And so temporary rail tracks were laid on the basin bed to move the people and even into the docks on temporary bridges. The basin bed had to be excavated to a lower level and steam excavators called navvies were brought in to do that. One of the main challenges at that time was how to build the outer seawall in deeper water, far too deep to use the clay dams. And again, the civil engineers were asked to come up with a viable solution. For this task, they decided to construct what are known as monoliths, large concrete blocks. They were constructed on the foreshore and floated out to the positions and sunk onto the seabed. Each of these blocks or monoliths were hollow inside and to improve productivity and enable the workers to get in at all states of the tide, the monoliths were extended vertically by adding cast iron rings which the men crawled through to access the chamber below. Very dangerous, very hazardous work. 120 monoliths were sunk, some of them taking as much as 700 days to get down to their final level. In some cases as deep as 29 metres below the seabed. Whilst all of this was going on, the Admiralty let a contract to Sir William Arrow to construct the massive dock gates that were needed to keep the graving docks dry when the dockyard was in operation. The docks had to be extremely robust because they had to accommodate very heavy battleships and they had to be on strong foundations. Fortunately, in most locations, the underlying rock was very strong and the dock floors could be laid quite thin on top of the rock. However, in certain occasions, the rock was far too weak and had to be excavated. And in those cases, dock floors were built in blocks seven meters by seven meters in plan and up to six meters deep. Each of the blocks was keyed to its adjacent block to form a very stable, robust dock floor. When the First World War broke out, the works were accelerated. And this enabled number one dock to be completed by 1916. And at that time, HMS Zealandia sailed up the fourth through the entrance lock across the, the, the non-tidal basin and docked down for the very first time in number one dock to allow its refit to start. The dockyard infrastructure remained largely unaltered for a period of time. But with the launch of Dreadnought, the UK's first nuclear submarine, civil engineers were called upon yet again to modify the precise infrastructure this time to equip it with the necessary facilities to enable nuclear submarines to be refitted and refuelled. It's interesting that all of Britain's Polaris submarines and many of her hunter-killer submarines have been fitted 
refitted at the scythe. In 2002, a decision was taken to terminate nuclear refitting here, and the refit of HMS Spartan was the last refit to take place. So here we are at the bottom of number one dock, and I want to talk about the third and most recent phase in the development of Resyth Dockyard. This dock was selected as the site for constructing the Queen Elizabeth and class aircraft carriers, the biggest vessels ever to enter service with the Royal Navy. And I'm now going to hand you over to Sean Donaldson, who's going to talk a little bit about the vessel assembly. At 65,000 tonnes, the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers are the largest warships and most, some of the most complex warships ever built for the Royal Navy. The ship was assembled using super blocks, which are large sections of ship uh, constructed across the UK from uh, Babcock's facility in Appledore to Portsmouth, A&P Tyne, uh, also in Birkenhead. The blocks were then brought to the scythe where they, they were assembled uh, utilising the skidding system that was um, installed as part of the dock upgrade that is designed to draw the blocks together. The blocks were then welded together in place and after the, the full process was complete we had a fully assembled aircraft carrier that was then outfitted in number one dock. On completion of the assembly stage uh, the ship left number one dock to go to Jane K berth where it undertook the commissioning phase uh, over a, a year's work, uh, worth of work. It then left Resyth Dockyard in July 2017 where it then headed to the, the North Sea to complete sea trials before heading to Portsmouth. The dock at 320 metres in length was long enough to accommodate the vessels. The dock was just wide enough as well. The problem was how to get the vessels in the entrance was too small, as indeed was the entrance from the river into the non-tidal basin, and both of these had to be widened significantly to let the, the vessels in. An added complication, not a problem that was encountered when the dockyard was originally constructed, was that the basin was full of water and we had an active dockyard here. So the civil engineers had to come up with a clever way of doing all of this work and keeping the dockyard fully operational at the time. The plan was to build steel dams, called coffer dams, one at the mouth of number one dock and one on each side of the direct entrance. Once complete, the area in front of number one dock and both sides of the direct entrance were pumped dry and for the first time in over a hundred years, the seabed at Resyth was once again visible to the naked eye. This created enough space for people to demolish the old structures construct new foundations and build new wider entrances and I'm delighted to say that the carrier was easily supported by the structures both old and new. Lastly, a huge goliath crane which we saw at the beginning had to be installed. Because this area is largely fill, very soft material, the ground isn't strong enough to support the crane so a massive regime of piles was installed on both sides of the docks to carry the weight of the crane and enable the crane to be installed. Well, here standing at the head of number one dock, it's uh, important to emphasise how vital the third and final stage of the upgrading of Resyth has been. Without the efforts of all the specialists, the civil engineers and the contractors involved, it wouldn't have been possible to modify the dockyard. I'm delighted to say that in 2011, all of these people's efforts were recognised when they were awarded the Saltire Award for Civil Engineering Excellence. Civil engineering is a great profession. I've had a fantastic time working as a civil engineer. Every morning I've been excited to come to my work, to do something that I found very satisfying. The emphasis today has moved perhaps more towards the environment. And civil engineers have a significant part to play in looking after the environment in designing environmentally friendly facilities, systems, transportation, energy, infrastructure. Anybody who wants to study civil engineering has a choice. It is a multidisciplinary profession. It's an exciting profession, and I would thoroughly recommend it to anybody who feels that they want to do something significant going forward.